Welcome to Model 45, Tikhonov's Theorem. So, Tikhonov's Theorem is a landmark result in the development of point set topology. The key result that we are going to use as a step for Tikhonov's Theorem is that this is called Alexander Subbase Theorem. That XP a topological space and fix a subbase S for its topology. Then X is compact if and only if every cover of X by subfamily of S admits a finite subcover for X. We have seen that. If x, if x has a sub base such that open covers from this sub base, sub, from this base, they admit a finite sub cover, then x is compact. That much we have seen already. But Alexander sub base theorem goes one step ahead. It says instead of base, you can just use a sub base. The proof of Alexander sub base theorem itself is not very straightforward. So we shall postpone the proof of this one, but use this one to prove Tikhonov's theorem. Okay. So once again, I repeat that Alexander subbase theorem essentially cuts down the verification of compactness of a space from arbitrary open covers to open covers coming from a single subbase. So that is the whole idea. Tikhonov's theorem can be stated as follows. Start with a family of topological spaces, each of them non-empty. Then the product space Xi is compact if and only if each X little i is compact. Okay, what we have seen is that if the product space is compact, each factor space is compact. Of course, for this you have to use the, that xi's are non-empty, therefore the projection maps are surjective. A surjective continuous function takes compact sets to compact sets. That is an easy theorem that you have proved. Using that, it will follow that if product space is compact, then each xi is compact. Now, we have to prove the converse. Assume that each xi is compact. Let S be the standard subbase for product topology which we have been using, namely consisting of all PI inverse of UI for all open sets UI inside XI and for all I inside I. By Alexander subbase theorem, if we show that an open cover from S, you know, members of S, that admits is a finite subcover. That's enough. Okay. Any arbitrary open cover, but members are from S. If that admits a finite subcover, then X will be compact. So that's what we want to show now that starting with an arbitrary open cover with members of S, we will show that there is a finite subcover. So for each I in I, put ui equal to those ui inside xi such that this pi inverse of ui is in s prime. This s prime is the subcover that we have chosen. It's a, a cover that we have chosen. Members of s prime cover x. From this we want to extract the finite subcover. 
so first i define ui this is a so family this is a uh, you know so family members of of open subsets in xi those ui is in xi so say P, pi inverse of ui is contained inside this s prime then each member of ui by the very definition is open in xi okay we claim that for at least one i ui is a cover for xi okay we are not claiming that all the uis will cover corresponding xi here at least for one of the indices this must happen is what we want to say if not what happens there exist some xi little xi belonging to capital xi minus the union of all the uis in ui because this is not a cover for every i this will happen okay so pick up one point xi in the complement of this so this gives you one element x belonging to x capital i okay to be such that pi i of x equal to xi now x is in some member of f say because this, this is my this s prime here okay say x belongs to pi j inverse of u j for some pi j inverse u j belonging to some s prime that is what for some j this means that if x belongs to this one means its j projection is x little j which we have chosen must be inside u j and with u j belonging to some curly u j that will be contradiction because we have chosen this one to be such that they are in the complement of all this okay so therefore one of the uis will cover the whole of xi say u1 just for definiteness sake u1 is a cover for x1 since x1 is compact this gives you a finite sub cover which you will call it a u11 u1n okay it follows that pi p1 inverse of u1 j you take p1 inverse of these things will form a finite sub cover for x sub i from s prime they are members of s prime that's how we have chosen but this is now cover because x1 is the union of all these things so p1 inverse of all these things will be the whole inverse of oh, 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 cover for x i and these are members from this one so that completes the proof okay that completes the proof of tikhonov's theorem there are several proofs of this important theorem indeed <laughs> it is a fashion with every aspiring topologist to give his own proof of tikhonov's theorem never mind that only a few of them may succeed nevertheless there are quite a few quite a few proofs of this theorem okay now let me give you an example here namely our favorite example r with semi interval topology lower limit topology or sort of gen fry topology and so on there are various things this we have seen early, uh, earlier several times okay this space is a lindelof space okay so let g be a family of semi open intervals which cover r okay so i am trying to prove why it is a lindelof space it's not very very easy to see okay it is enough to show that this admits a countable sub cover okay so i am using that this s is actually a base here open subsets of the form a comma b a closed and a b open that is the definition of this uh, uh, topology l okay take a cover by these open sets 
there is no need to take uh, unions of these things and so on. This is the base, so you can take this one and then show that this is a uh, countable subcover. Okay. So, what do we do? We will use the property of R in the usual topology and then compare it with this one. So, put u equal to union of open intervals AB where this A comma B, A close, these are members of this G. Okay. So, we started with G, a family of semi-open intervals which covers R. Now, you drop out the, the first point here in each interval okay, and take only open interval AB. Then, this union will be clear in open subset of the usual topology in R. But now, the usual topology is second countable. Therefore, it follows that there exists a countable subfamily A and B and contained inside G such that this U is union of countable many open sets. So, what I am using is every open subset of a second countable space is second countable, therefore it is Lindelof. Okay. If I just use directly R U is Lindelof, I do not know how to conclude this one is Lindelof because it is an open subset, not a closed subset. Okay, but if you say second countable, then every subspace is second countable and second countable spaces are Lindelof. So, you get a countable subcover for this subspace U which is an open subset. Therefore, why I have put Y or U whatever it is, Y U is open. Okay, now I put back all the ANs but only taking from this countable subcover, put y equal to union of bracket a and n, put back these points. This may not be the whole of R. If that were R, you are fine. See, we dropped out all these uh, starting points of the interval, right? The initial point of the interval, so you dropped out. Now you put back. But that may not be the whole of R. However, it is not difficult to see that whatever is left out, namely put f equal to r minus y, what are they? They are all the, the starting points of intervals a comma b coming from g. Some of them, some of them are already here in this countable family. Some of them are left out. That space f equal to r minus y is definitely a closed subspace. It is a discrete set. No open interval will be contained inside that one. The open parts have been taken care by this a and b n, open a and b n. So that is easy to see that. And hence it follows that f is countable. Once f is countable, you pick up open subsets which cover F. Okay, for each one of them, one, one open subset from G. Along with that, you, you put all these A and B ends also, which you have got already. Together, you get a countable family that will cover the whole of R. Okay, so that shows that the, the semi-open interval topology is Lindelof. But now I am going to show that the product is not Lindelof. See, that was my idea. To show that, you know, we showed products, even infinite products and so on of compact species compact, right? And we are all the time telling that Lindelof property T keeps tagging on. So, this is one phrase wherein it does not. Even product of two of them need not be Lindelof. Okay. So, take x equal to R S cross R S R L. I should be take this should be taken L because I have used this notation L here. Okay. So, Look at that is not Lindelof. 
for if it were then the anti diagonal x comma minus x x belong to r we have used this one earlier okay the anti diagonal being a closed subspace okay will be also lindelof because closed subspace of a lindelof space are lindelof on the other hand given any point x comma minus x in delta hat delta twiddle consider the open subset you know first closed x comma x plus 1 or x plus r whatever cross minus x comma minus x plus 1 some positive number minus x plus not necessarily 1 you take these open subsets these are open subsets in this x namely rl cross rl okay in the product topology all right what is the intersection of this one with the anti diagonal it will be just the first point x comma minus x okay so intersection with the subspace delta twiddle is just the single term that means all the single terms are open in delta twiddle in the subspace topology it just means that delta twiddle is a discrete space however it is its cardinality is the cardinality of r it's uncountable okay for each x inside r there is x comma minus x so an uncountable discrete space cannot be lindelof okay so product is not lindelof even product of two of them so this is the picture i have taken this is the anti diagonal x comma minus x in r cross r open subsets of this product space are of this nature x comma minus x plus s okay this is x comma minus x x plus r comma minus x and then these the dot 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 these parts are not there in the open part but these two lines are there intersection of that one with the anti diagonal is just this point okay so that is a picture for showing that the anti diagonal is what is a discrete subspace so we have given an example of lindelof so we have shown that product is compact if each coin is compact but the lindelof property is not even finite productive okay coming back to this alexander subbase theorem let us get a little bit familiar with one of the central results in the set theory which is very useful especially in topology and algebra of course we are going to employ this immediately in the proof of alexander subbase theorem okay so a little more point set topology here today and then we will wind up today tomorrow we will again proceed with alexander subbase theorem so this is about partial order and so on so start with a set which is partially ordered preferably non empty okay don't take empty set and by a maximal element in x we mean x belonging to x such that x is less than or equal to y for some y will imply x is equal to y so there is nothing sitting over x so that's the meaning of maximal element all right note that there may not be any maximal element inside x like if you take r with the usual order it has no maximal element that means it is not bounded right so there is no maximal element also there can be more than one maximal element okay so you can think about uh, you know if you take some subsets of any set then put a inclusion map it is it can have bigger on one bigger here one bigger here those two are not comparable and so on there are lots of such examples right so maximal elements may exist 
and also there may be plenty of them also. Either of them can. Now there is another simple definition by a chain in a partially ordered set, we mean a subset of the form whenever x and y are inside this subset, either x must be less than or equal to y or y must be less than or equal to x. Okay. Of course, if both of them happen, that is also allowed, but then x will be equal to y, that is by definition. In other words, y is a chain if and only if under the restricted order it becomes a totally ordered set. That is another name for it. Totally ordered set always has this property. Okay. A totally ordered subset of a partially ordered set will be called a chain. So we have just uh, introduced another word here, which is popular in the in the point set no, point set uh, theory. Let y be a subset of some partially ordered set. An element z inside x is called an upper bound for y if y belongs to y implies y is less than or equal to z. So, this is an upper bound. So, all these things are very, you know, very straightforward definitions. But these definitions are now made in arbitrary partially ordered set. That is what you have to be careful. Not inside r or q or integers and so on. Okay. They will, of course, apply to R, Q, uh, all those things also. But this is a general partially ordered set. All right. Now, here is what is called as John's lemma, which is almost like one of the axioms of point set uh, theory, you know, set theory as such, equivalent to axioms of choice. John's lemma says that start with any non-empty partially ordered set. Suppose every chain in this X has an upper bound, then X has at least one maximal element. It does not say anything about uniqueness, of course. There may be plenty of them. It just assures you there is a maximal element. Okay, so there is John's lemma. All right. So, next time we shall use this one very effectively to prove Alexander's base theorem. Thank you.